Hello, and welcome to How I Built This Resilience Edition. This is the place where we hear about how businesses and founders are building resilience. And my guest today is Morgan DeBond. She's the co-founder of Blavity. Blavity is a media company and website created by and for Black millennials. Last month, Blavity had more than 38 million unique viewers. Actually, that was in May, so probably last month even more. Um, her company is now valued at over $30 million. Morgan, welcome. It's so great to have you. Thanks for having me. Um, and by the way, if you're watching this on Facebook or on Twitter or YouTube, you can submit questions for Morgan. So please um, start submitting those questions. We love getting your questions. It makes the conversation so much richer and more interesting. So please submit those. Um, first of all, how are you? W where are you? Tell us a little bit about where you are. I'm in LA, uh, bright and sunny LA, and uh, I used to live in downtown LA, but I moved south of LA to a beach town uh, so I could have a little peace and quiet. Yeah, and how, how have you been holding up? I mean, it's, I, I can't remember, I don't even know how long it's been. It's It's been like, what, like two years since the pandemic started? <laughs> um, how, how have you been doing? Um, I think now I'm okay. Um, I felt like I just went to war. Uh, a little bit. So, you know, my body hurts a little bit. Uh, I have a little bit of PTSD. I mean, it was a very traumatic experience running a business and having to make some very tough decisions um, about people and business model and make a lot of pivots and still exude confidence leading a group of people to help manage their anxieties uh, and, and fear of uncertainty. Um, and then, you know, during that pandemic that we're still very much in, um, having the social unrest and really going into overdrive as a company and as a mission of who we serve um, while having limited resources because of COVID. So it's been very long, a uh, couple of months, um, and I'm very proud of you know what we've been able to accomplish despite kind of all the things going on. But um, yeah, I feel a little bit tired, Guy. Yeah. So so just to for for, for people watching who may not know, Blavity is a news website. You've got all these different brands, travel sites and tech, and you do conferences and politics sites and beauty and lifestyle verticals. Um, can you tell us a, a bit more about Blavity? Yeah, so Blavity is, um, Blavity Inc. is a media company and platform, really at our core work community um, for the Black community, for the young Black people in this country. Um, I started it when I was first in Silicon Valley and in tech and mostly because I felt lonely um, and there was a lot of, of opportunity to kind of create more spaces for young black people in this country. And I wanted us as a community to have our own brand where we could tell our own stories and share our own heroes. And so it's grown um, to your point about different lifestyles and, and different verticals, um, we really try to encompass the entire fullness of blackness, which includes, you know, not just um, news, but also travel and food and music and art and culture and storytelling. Um, Shadow and Act, one of our brands, focuses on black Hollywood. Uh, Afrotech focuses on black innovators and technologists and venture funding. So we really try to make sure that the business is diversified across the many different types of experiences within the black diaspora. Um, and media has been one element of it, but also our conferences and eventually um, more innovations in, in our space. And I was just checking out Travel Noir. I love that. I love that name. I know. I think you guys acquired that a couple of years ago. And they have right now. Check it out. The top ten best black-owned restaurants in Atlanta. Oh, it was an article in there that I just saw. So check that out. I'm um, just a plug for that site. It's super cool. Um, I I love this founding story of it. And I want to just ask you a little bit about it because you were a student at Washington University in St. Louis where you grew up. And from what I understand, like you used to have these really amazing, like movable feast conversations with with friends, um, group of black students. And you kind of, I guess, jokingly called it black gravity and then started calling it blavity. And that was kind of the genesis of, of what, of this media company. Um, how did, how did you like take that idea? And then I know you, you worked in the tech sector for, for a couple of years after college at into it. Mm -hmm. um, and then like come to the realization that I'm going to, I want to do this. I want to take that spirit and that energy and I want to turn it into a, a media company. Yeah. So there's this moment at the lunch table um, that I think a lot of people of color have this experience where, you know, maybe you're not the majority at the school, but when it comes to the cafeteria, like, 
you all have your moment, you know, and at, at Wash U, um, it was the black table and Blavity was a, a phrase that um, was just used and kind of passed down between the black students year over year. And um, it was that emotional feeling of like, okay, one person sits down and then 10 people sit down and then you've got people and you're like, do you even go here anymore? Like, <laughs> you know, and having those conversations about class or proofreading each other's essays or what you guys did last night or, you know, just the, a really feeling of openness and belonging. And even if you hadn't sat at the table for a few weeks, you know, people be like, where have you been? You know, it's always open arms um, and some tough conversations. You didn't always agree, but you learned a lot. And um, for me, that was a place where I grew in my black identity and I challenged, I got challenged about, you know, what does it mean to be black? My experience growing up in St. Louis isn't the same experience as someone who grew up as a first generation, second generation Nigerian American. And what does that look like? Or someone who went to uh, an all black high school and what's their experience when I went to an all girls Catholic high school? Like, what does that mean? And Blavity, um, when I moved to Silicon Valley in Mountain View, uh, which didn't really reflect St. Louis and black, you know, black diversity or anything, um, I felt disconnected from my community and I was missing that sense and that feeling of warmth. And so Blavity was trying to bring that feeling back into our lives on a daily basis through content and connections and stories um, and making it easier for people to really stay um, and build relationships with each other through the internet. And just a reminder, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, we're taking your questions from Morgan, so please um, submit those questions. Um, and, and to that point, Morgan, I mean, you know, there 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 was Huffington Post and BuzzFeed and, and Vox and different companies that had verticals, but it sounds like, you know, you were saying there's nothing that speaks to um, Black millennials and, and Gen Zers, and that really was the sort of the genesis and the catharsis behind kind of creating this. That's right. And even, um, you know, there's certainly black legacy media organizations that I have so much respect for. I know you had Kathy Hughes here sure. um, and they've done a fantastic job. I also think that there's a new generation and we use technology differently. And I mean, we have, have had interns where I'm like, oh, you guys are, I'm old now, <laughs> you know, like they're using technology even differently than, than the millennials are in Gen Z. And so how do we continue to have that connectivity that we used to have with the radio or with local newspapers that were printed online, right? Yeah. And, and what does it look like to have a truth house and a brand that people trust to help bring people together? And so that's what Blavity's really our core mission is. Yeah. I mean, you, you launched this business, I think you were, you were just 24 years old. Um, and which is, which takes a lot of courage for any 24 year old to launch a business. Um, was there, was there a moment of sort of a catalyst where you were like, I'm, I got to do this. Cause you had this, probably this incredible, you know, you had this incredible sort of horizon in the tech sector. You had this job at Intuit and, and probably the sky was a limit, but what was the thing that gave you the courage to say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, give all that security up and I'm going to take a risk and do this. Well, um, you know, I was feeling frustrated. Um, I felt like working in tech um, and working at a big tech company, I loved learning about the innovation and the process and the mindset of Silicon Valley. I think it is um, limitless in terms of, and it's so contagious to be around people who talk about making billion dollar companies and building a technology platform that billions of users is going are going to use and changing people's lives you know that is um so cool you know and i i didn't grow up around that in the midwest and so um i loved silicon valley for that and what it gave me i also felt like as a young black woman working at a tech company where you know, I was 24 and I was probably still in the top 15 black women in the entire company. <laughs> Not because there was a lot of black women at the entire company, but because there's probably only 15, right? And in that, and so in a company of over, you know, 5,000 employees. So I also felt constrained. I felt like I had to, I was transitioning my hair at the time into natural hair. And I just felt like I was constantly tiptoeing, being polite. Um, not wanting to be too aggressive, but also being like, I'm, I'm smart. I have things to say. I have things to contribute. Um, and so I was wearing an extra layer that was draining my energy every day when I went into work when all I wanted to do was build and create 
and be a part of this ecosystem. And then at the same time, I was sitting in San Francisco and I was watching um, my city burn when Mike Brown happened. And I was watching the discrepancy between the news and the mainstream news media and the coverage and what was happening on the ground. And in, I also- Ferguson and, and yeah. In Ferguson, right. Um, which is, you know, right outside of the, the city of St. Louis, slightly north. Um, and so that felt, um, I felt helpless. And so I wanted to use my skills and the access and the information that I that I have been learning through Silicon Valley, and maybe naively of having only been there for two years, <laughs> but here we are nonetheless. Um, and I quit. You know, I quit my job and I worked on Blavity full time. We had already launched a version of it over the summer, um, and but I really at that point, you know, quit my job in in the fall right after Mike Brown happened. Um, we're getting questions in in for Morgan. If you got questions, please submit them Facebook, Twitter, um, what else? YouTube. Um, Taylor James asked what inspired you to found Blavity, which so, Taylor, I think we, Taylor, I think we answered the question, but let me, um, let me, I mean, ask you about, um, you know, a, a, about that, that moment. I mean, you, 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 about this moment, actually, I mean, you have now this company that, and I'm kind of fast forwarding because you've raised a lot of money. It's valued the last valuation was $30 million. Incredible. And I have to imagine that like a lot of media companies, you're in this kind of, including NPR, you're in this sort of weird situation now because you probably are getting a lot of traffic to your site, right? There's a lot of interest. People are shut in. They're, they're, they want information. They're looking at Blavity. They're looking at NPR. They're looking at media organizations. At the same time, like we are in this, we're also in this economic crisis. Like we are also... Uh, suffering economically. So has, has that been your situation where on the one hand, you're like, your numbers are, are record highs, but the, the, the business side is, is, is hurting right now. Yeah. You know, one of the things I am incredibly grateful for is the new attention on stories and conversations that we've been having since the founding of Levy, right? We cover these stories of police brutality and, you know, death and murder um, that's why we were created. Yeah. You know, that was the final straw that I was like, we got to do something, anything. We got to do something, you know, um, and why not me? And I think a lot of us right now are also asking that question. It's like, we got to do something and why not me? And let, let me take responsibility personally first to learn and to educate. And that is beautiful to see, right? Um, and in fact, that's what we've been waiting for in so many ways is this moment we've been writing these stories to deaf ears for so many years. So I think our editorial and our news team feels energized, um, but also that it's mentally draining to your point to work in an environment where people are understaffed or under-resourced and where that's exacerbated by the economic toll. And uh, secondarily for us as a black media company, you know, people are very sensitive about running ads or campaigns against black death or murder or social justice, because that's not always ad safe or ad friendly. So I find myself constantly at this tension of running a business that's for profit with investors. To your point, I've raised you know over $11 million of fantastic investors that support the mission, but it is a for profit entity and managing and honoring the people, the humans that I'm responsible for. And we've had to do layoffs that have been very difficult, difficult wow. choices. We did salary reductions. Um, you know, all the, all the things that many other media companies have done, we've had to go through as well. And so how do I reconcile that? You know, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. I mean, it's really hard to reconcile that because you're, as I say, I mean, you're, you're getting record traffic, probably, probably more traffic than you've ever had ever. And at mm -hmm. the same time, you know, you're kind of forced to, 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 to make some of these hard decisions. Um, and you also do conferences and you also support black entrepreneurs. I mean, you had, I think you, you guys were planning to do, and you do this big conference called Afrotech. You're planning on doing it in Oakland in November. Um, what's, what's the status of that? Yeah. Afrotech is like the best experience ever that you'll ever go to. You guys have to come. Um, so last year was in Oakland. It was 10,000 people. This would have been a year four. No, this would have been year five. I can't remember now. Everything blurs together. Um, and we were expecting between fifteen and 20,000 people, which is the biggest conference Oakland has every year. 
And um, yeah, we've had to cancel it. So we're working on a virtual experience called Afrotech World, which is a different experience. Um, we'll have avatars, people will be able to walk around. We'll still have booths. Um, we have fantastic corporations who sponsor the experience because they want to hire and bring black people into the technology industry. Um, and so we've had a lot of success working with our clients to make sure that they can still recruit. Um, and we've built, we've pivoted the business. I mean, the essence of our business has had to accelerate in some areas where we were moving a little bit slower prior to, prior to COVID. So we're building out a social network and a platform that will also allow for people to engage and com communicate. We launched an app for a travel noir community so that they could also stay connected. Um, we're thinking about a nonprofit and what it looks like to actually have a more explicit social impact mission. Um, so in some ways, this has accelerated some things that we've been wanting to do, but maybe didn't have the time or the intention to make those critical decisions, but it is still difficult. Um, Morgan, I, I read this, such a cool story. Um, when you were a kid, you used to take um, Kool-Aid and make your own fun dip and sell it to other kids and you'd go to Costco and sell candy. And like, you were an entrepreneur from, uh, um, I, by the way, I loved fun dip. I didn't even know it's still around. Um, I don't know if it is, but it was my jam. I love fun dip. It's so great. And I love that Kool-Aid fun dip. And so you were doing entrepreneurial things from the time you were a little girl. Um, did you, did you always want to do that? Did you always think I'm, I'm going to start a business one day? No, I didn't know a name for it. Um, I, I didn't put a label on it until I don't even think when I really started Blavity, I was like, I'm an entrepreneur. Like <laughs> I just have always been someone who's like, that rule doesn't make any sense. The reason I did the fun dip and went to Costco is because the city made some sort of rule where there was no candy in the vending machines. <laughs> I was going to prevent kids from having candy. <laughs> I was like, well, that's a stupid rule. Is it illegal for me to sell candy to each other? Like, no. Okay, great. Like, you know, so I, I just always, challenge the rules um and ask the question well like but why you know and like what is this really solving for and um i've also you know always tried to bring people along with me you know in whatever journey it is uh for, for good or bad you know i also was the girl who got suspended for redistributing candy in that same school so you know it's uh sometimes i haven't always gotten the upside of, of the of a win yeah um, we're getting a bunch of questions in about entrepreneurship, and I know you do a lot of mentoring, which I want to talk to you about in a sec, but I want to get to this question from Catherine togba -Woyi. Um, She submitted through Facebook. She writes, I'm the founder of Black Parent Magazine. It's a media company created by Black parents for Black, mixed, foster, adopted, LGBTQ parents of Black children. Um, and she asks, how how do I raise money for my platform? Like She, she says she needs more staff, more resources. Um, do you do you have any advice or suggestions um, for ways that she can think about bringing in some some more financial resources to to build up her company? Yeah, so um, you know, raising money and venture funding, getting venture funding is very difficult, and it's something that I think increasingly has become more and more accessible to the Black community. And so, I really encourage people to consider. Um, Consider it and make sure that it's it's something that makes sense for your business. Now, also, venture funding isn't for every business model, right? Um, you know, you have to very much be on a mission to build a hundred million dollar plus business, right? And and be able to get to 40, 50 million dollars in revenue plus, right? Yeah. Um, and so um, I think that sometimes people may look at Blavity and say, well, it's a media company that's raised venture funding. Um, and it's it's really more of a it's a company that raised venture funding because we have a huge audience and we're building products, brands, experiences for that audience, um, one of which is media, right? And I think media alone as an industry is very difficult to get venture funding for. Um, we've seen so many media companies go out of business. Now, I say all of that to answer her question directly, focus on your business model. Um, figure out how you can scale without venture funding and focus on revenue because typically having revenue now that it is a little bit easier to get venture funding, people are going to look for a little bit more traction. So they're going to want to see that you have proven out that you can scale your audience or you've proven out that you can scale out your revenue. So focus on those two things first. 
Um, and then there is a lot of, there's a lot of programs. Founder Gym is one of them. Um, I know Y Combinator has different programs. Um, All Race has different programs for minority entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in general who want to learn how more about venture funding. So definitely check those out. When you, when you get um, young, you know, young college graduates coming up to you and saying, Morgan, I want to be like you. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to jump into this. Um, um, what is it that you wish you knew three, four, five years ago that you now know that would have made it maybe just a little bit easier when you started? So many things, guy. <laughs> I didn't know anything. I mean, I didn't know the vocabulary ARR and MRR and CAC. Like, I didn't know any of the acronyms. Um, and I think that's okay. I actually don't think you need to know all no. that stuff to get started. Um, but I think that I would have wanted to maybe understand fully the venture funding model. You know, when you take venture funding, the only way people get their money back is if you exit. Yeah. So uh, that's tough. That's a very tough thing that I have to struggle with because that means that we are selling it to someone else um, and that there's a constant push and drive towards that that milestone. And that not necessarily wasn't the milestone that I set out to create for. Yeah. Um, so I think I would have thought about that a little bit more and maybe changed the business a little bit earlier. Um, and so I, I really do encourage people to think through like, I know they always say, well, don't worry about the outcome or who you're going to sell to when you're first raising money. I think it's important to think through those things, actually. Hmm. And obviously, I mean, another option could be to go public, like like Kathy Hughes, you just mentioned, Urban One is a public company. But there are, obviously, there are all kinds of trade-offs because, as you say, your investors aren't giving you money because they're nice. They're giving you money because they want to return one day. That's right. That's right. And IPO, I mean, more kudos to Kathy for being a, a public company but wow the scrutiny the the personal scrutiny of, of many board of directors and and public ceos yeah Top. um all right more questions coming in this is from david uh, kagulu kalema also from facebook he asks what's been your approach to foster continued communication team building culture as you as you move to managing distributed teams this is such a good question right now right how how are you how are you doing that how are you building your teams and, and, and keeping people motivated and also keeping morale up and maintaining the culture that you, that you started to create in the company? Yeah, you know, um, as a fast growing startup, we always, I think, struggled with how to maintain that sense of community and culture within the company. It was something that um, at different times in our history may not have always been the best. And so we've spent a lot of time even prior to COVID focusing on increasing communication and transparency with the team, having more regular feedback sessions with the executive team or HR, building an HR team at all. Um, and so I think in a lot of ways, we were actually prepared um, to go fully remote because we had already done a lot of that legwork and started to kind of change the ship so that we could um, have a group of people who were happy in a work environment where we're doing all this really hard work. Um, so, that being said, I have increased my communication with the team more regularly. So I do a, a meeting with our directors every other week. I meet with all of our associates every other week, and I meet with all of our managers every other week. So essentially, I'm doing three all hands, <laughs> um, mostly because I want people to have a space to share feedback directly with me. Um, there was a lot of things that I missed as we scaled because of middle managers and directors and Sometimes information doesn't always pass up and down the way that it needs to. And I, I think I might have learned that a little too late in some cases. Um, and then also so I can make sure that they're hearing directly from me what's happening and what's going on. And so we do product demos. We do um, like talk about new things coming up. I share with them, hey, we're having a board meeting. These are things we're talking about. So it, it's actually something that's a highlight of my week now because I learn so much so fast because I don't get to see them anymore. Um, and a lot of times my team is what was keeping me motivated to really fight these fights once I stepped out of the office. Um, so I, I, I miss them deeply. I mean, Morgan, you're running a media company that not only was coping with the pandemic and then an economic crisis, but also a huge social justice crisis and, and reawakening. Um, the most you know profound, important protest movement in the United States in at least 50 years. Um, how is your team kind of just 
just dealing with that emotionally and and how are you dealing with that how, how have you been dealing with that emotionally yeah so you know the week of um well first it was Ahmad and then it was Brianna and then it was George and um so we had a town hall that Friday and I mean I'll be honest with you I broke down in tears yeah. as soon as I saw all their faces on that zoom <laughs> You know, um, and my co-founders, I'm so grateful for them, Aaron and Jeff, were able to carry the meeting because it's very heavy. Um, so I think, you know, everyone's doing their best, but it's hard. Yeah. 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 And and doubly hard because, I mean, because of, of what you're trying to do and, and, and what you're trying to say and, um, and who you're trying to reach. Um, this is a question from um, from Monica Rojas. She asks, um, how do you, and I, I think Monica is asking on, on her own behalf, how do you reach black communities um, throughout the nation and not just in your city or your region or in your local area? Do you have any suggestions or advice for Monica? Um, that's a great question. You know, I think that uh, the internet's a beautiful place. I mean, you're just a hashtag away from reaching a lot of people. So. Um, understanding how sub communities kind of group together on Twitter or Reddit or Instagram, um, even within Facebook groups, that's something that we've used to accelerate our growth is actually really focusing on the niche communities within our community because um, we found that the shares and the virality is much higher when you're actually niching down even further. So um, think about kind of the core demographics and also look at the data. You know, we spend a ton of time looking at our Google Analytics, um, understanding our audience and our super users and understanding what, what they want and what they want to share. And I think that has given us more clarity about the kinds of things we need to continue to do to grow. Morgan, I don't know how you do all these things because you've got all these verticals and then you also have something called the Work Smart Program. Um, this is a program that you you do to help entrepreneurs of color and to give them advice. And you've been giving a lot of advice here. So thank you for that. Um, I think, it, it, um, as you know, and, and we talked about this with Kathy Hughes a couple of days ago, um, I mean, entrepreneurship in the United States in general actually has been declining since the 1980s and really acutely in communities of color. You know, there are fewer black owned banks today than there were in the 1980s, fewer black owned insurance companies today than there were in the 1980s. Um, so through the work that you're doing, how do you sort of see a path forward? Like, um, I, I hate this this cliche, but I, it's the only thing that's coming to my mind, a, a light at the end of the tunnel where you, you, you could see like a resurgence in black entrepreneurship in, in America in, in 10 years from now. Like, do you see a path to that? Yeah, you know, I started my WorkSmart program because I was getting so many questions from entrepreneurs and I personally could not one-to-one -one advise everyone. And a lot of the questions were the same questions. And so I do these group calls and master classes where you know, I can get hundreds of people um, and we can, you know, all talk at the same time. So it brings me a lot of joy and a lot of hope, I think, um, in terms of helping also just small business owners, which I think are a bit different than startup founders. So small business owners, which really are the backbone of our economy in so many ways, um, oftentimes don't have the resources, the tools, and, and the access to information on how to use very simple things like Google Analytics or SEO or Asana for project management or Upwork for hiring contractors. So I try to just teach them the things that I've learned and used in my business to help me scale and grow so that they can kind of skip a few steps. Um, and my hope is that the impact is actually greater for them because they're they're going from one employee to five employees, right, um, in their businesses. So that's really what I focus on. Um, my hope in terms of the future of entrepreneurs and people of color entrepreneurs, you know, I, I am actually relatively hopeful. Um, on the venture and the Silicon Valley side, there's never been a better time to raise a million to $5 million as a black founder in this country. Um, you know, it took uh, me a lot of no's to get $500,000 for Gravity, and I had a million users at the time. If I went out today with, with that, uh, I would raise $5 million because there's more venture funds of some minorities and women of color. Um, there are more minority owned venture funds, which is also super critical that have raised between 10 and $50 million in funding, um, which is that seed stage. And so I think it's a great time to consider venture if, if that's something that's right for your business. Um, and then for small business owners, I am worried. 
I'm very worried because I think people may have been able to survive COVID, but maybe aren't able to survive a secondary um, close down yeah. and they don't have the cash and they don't have the access to capital from banks. So where do you float? You can't float from your family necessarily. We know the wealth gap in America is atrocious. Um, so where, what happens? Um, that worries me. So I think financing for small businesses, small business owners is something we need to focus on. I know it's very sexy to finance a black startup founder, but like, let's also do the small business owners. Yeah. I want to ask you about your your business model and the pivot. I mean, the, one of the pivots you talked about was the conference because the conference, I'm assuming, is an important generator of revenue for your business. And now you're pivoting to a virtual conference. So it will be you'll bring in presumably you'll bring in less money, but your costs will also be lower. This is a, also a question from David Davidson on Facebook, which is um, how do you how do you how are you able to continue to generate um, cash flow, um, especially now during the during, during this economic crisis? Yeah, so um, Blavity, we've always had a diversified business um, because I did not want to be dependent on venture funding. So we've prioritized revenue um, at our core in terms of operating because it was important that we had multiple industries and multiple revenue streams. So we make money through display advertising. So we have an ad network and we you know, run ads direct and programmatically across all of our sites. And by um, interrupt, how many, I mean, you must reach millions and millions and millions of people through those ads. Exactly. Like, yes, a lot, a day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's that's awesome, and that helps us, I think, you know, maintain some level of costs, um, particularly on the media side of the business. Although some some websites that we have are not profitable, so we're still running a deficit on them as we're growing their audience. Um, and then we have the conferences business, so Summit Twenty One, AfroTech. Um, one of the things that we've learned is that our uh, enterprise clients and advertising agencies that work with us, they tend to want actually to go deep with our audience and our community. So they buy bundles. They'll buy integrations across multiple platforms. We just mm -hmm. want podcast. So thinking about, you know, okay, well, let's do a sponsorship here, display ads over here, a branded video series over here, and an influencer campaign on social media. And so that's allowed us to kind of weather the storm because as, as one thing goes up, something else goes down. Yeah. Um, and similarly with industries, there are some industries that are ramping up their spend, right? The audio industry, um, the food services industry. So um, also having a diversity of clients has helped us. Our travel clients, our yeah. transportation clients, not doing so well. Um, yeah. But in other places, they're spending more money than they did before COVID. So interesting. Um, I've got time for one more question. This is from Kat um, via YouTube. I love this question. Thank you for this question, Kat. Uh, Morgan, when 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 it gets really tough you know on the really tough days um and man we've had some tough days over the last um few months um what 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 keeps you going what is it about the work you do that keeps you going mm, the success stories the dms i get from like a small business owner who we just like featured on instagram and you know they sold out of their product um, or a DM from a traveler um, who joined the Travel Noir community and was finally felt safe to travel, do a solo trip, you know, a solo road trip. Um, or the venture funded startup who went to Afrotech and never thought that it was a space for them, but they saw so many people and so many stories that they were like, I can do this. And then they did it. You know, those are the stories I'm like, okay, we got to keep going. You know, um, so so those are what motivates me on the tough, tough days. I, I do want to ask you one more question. This is from Walter Triplett from Facebook because I have this question too, which is in five years from now, um, where do you where do you want Blavity to be? What do you want it to be? And what do you want to take away from this moment that 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 you actually bring with you? You know, the way this moment has changed your leadership and your outlook. Um, what, what are those things you want to take with you to the future? I think for me as a leader, um, to listen more, I mean, I'm always learning um, and I'm always growing. So just continuing to um, challenge my own assumptions about what leadership can look like and also being a little less apologetic about um, 
some of the things that we've, we've been able to accomplish. You know, I think we've been able to do a lot with a little, and I'm very proud of the work that my team has accomplished and what we've been able to build together. So figuring out how we can continue to bring others along the way is something that's really important to me. And, and what does it look like for our employees to continue to grow? What does it look like for our community to continue to grow and develop? Um, what technology can I bring to the table? So I think we have the, the future is very bright. Um, despite how dark some of the stories may be in the country, I, I am very hopeful that this is a moment in time where people can be more reflective and grow as individuals and as humans. Um, Morgan Devon, co-founder of Blavity, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And before you go, I just want to say hello to some, I'm sorry I couldn't get to all the questions on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you for those questions. Um, and just say hello to a couple people watching. Um, Savant Moore in Houston, Texas. Uh, Caroline Grab, uh, Kaylee in Dallas. Skyra Thomas in Houston. Gloria Garcia in Miami. Deborah Davidson, Davison in Austin. Rachel Lauer in Calgary. Uh, Alan Long in Ohio. Catherine Snyder in Philadelphia. Tabitha Yafosua in Southern Indiana, so many others. Thank you for watching. Um, really quickly, we're gonna be back on Friday uh, with another live conversation with Julia Hartz, the founder and CEO of Eventbrite, um, a company that is involved with ticketing events. So of course they are having a whole series of challenges right now. And it'll be really, really fascinating to hear from Julia. Um, so she'll join us right here, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern, same location. So join us on Friday. Um, we had a brand new episode, uh, sorry, a repeat episode that was released on Monday, but a really fun episode. Um, it's Bobby Trussell. He's the he's the co-founder of Tempur-Pedic. Um, he made one of the most incredible pivots of all time. He was involved in the horse racing business and slept on a mattress in Sweden one night, and he and he had a revelation to to bring them to the U.S. It's so funny. You got to check it out. Um, so that's on the podcast queue right now. Next week, we've got a brand new episode coming out again, uh, Tatcha, the cosmetics brand. So check out, uh, look out for that. Um, once again, Morgan, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. And I'll see you back here on Friday. Bye, everybody.